Thank you. <laughs> Didn't she sound much better than I did? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. This morning we're going to uh, uh, restart, if you will, our study of the book of Romans. Uh, some time ago we studied and we made it all the way through and including chapter 8. And uh, it was a good study. It's always good to study the book of Romans. And we sort of uh, took a break for a while. And, and, and this morning we're going to uh, begin again. But just to review in the book of Romans so far, we've seen in chapter 1 where, where God is uh, not happy with the way mankind has acted. And, and we see where his wrath was being poured out on all of the um, people who were repressing the truth and choosing to live in sin. But yet then we see that God offers us his, his justification. And he, he says to us that, listen, all of you have sinned. And so uh, he makes available salvation to us through what Jesus Christ has, has done on the cross. And, and we realize in chapter 5 that he didn't make us do anything to deserve what Jesus did for us. But that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what an amazing truth that is to realize that God is the one who is pursuing us. Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. And so we understand that it is God that is, that is moving in our hearts through the power of His Holy Spirit, through the convicting power, making us aware of the sin that's in our life and then offering to us a wonderful solution that His Son accomplished. Jesus died on the cross and, and paid the penalty for you and for me in His substitutionary death. I can now find forgiveness and we realize that there's a struggle with sin still. There is a push-pull. Uh, Don likes to say there's somebody on the right side of our shoulder and the, another guy on the left side of our shoulder really seemingly doing battle for our hearts and our minds and, and, and causing us to, to wrestle with doing the right thing. And we, we find this, this struggle all through uh, chapter 6 and, and we see in 7 where... where we can find freedom from the law. And then in Romans chapter 8, we celebrate because we read that now, there is now no more condemnation for any of us who are in Christ. And, and we celebrate because as, as Paul goes through some, some things that, that have come against us, we learn that in all things, we are more than conquerors. And again, not because of anything that we have done, but what Christ has done for us. And so we see in Romans 8 that God is truly in control. He is sovereign. And in fact, all things we find work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. And so we begin to understand that, that God in His foreknowledge and in His omnipotence and His omniscience, He looked down through all of the ages and through all of eternity and He placed His call upon us. And as Jesus says in the book of uh, Revelation, here I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens that door... Jesus said, I will come in. And so we understand that, that, that Jesus is very serious about what he's done for us. And he did it. We find in John 3.16, so that whosoever believes in him will not have to perish, but will have everlasting life. And, and so we understand that Romans 8 is, is a big celebration. And, and, and folks, we, we have the opportunity to rise above the sin that once ensnared us. 
to, to not be burdened down and enslaved any longer by the sin that used to control us. For we have been set free from the law of sin and we have now been made alive in the law of life and righteousness through what Jesus has done for us. And so now we come to Romans chapter 9. And in Romans chapter 9, we will begin to deal with some very interesting subjects. Some very interesting topics. We will have to be asking the question, what has God done with uh, the nation of Israel, who we read were his chosen people in the Old Testament? How does God work with us in the area of election? And so we will uh, do our best to address these truths and try to rightly divide the Word of God. And so begin with me here, <coughs> excuse me, in Romans uh, chapter 9 and beginning with verse number 1. And again, this is Paul writing here. And, and remember the celebratory mood that he displayed over in Romans chapter 8. Now we're going to see a different side of Paul. We're going to see him mourning as he begins to turn his eyes on his countrymen, on his people, the nation of Israel. And so we read, I tell you the truth in Christ." I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. And, and we see all of a sudden that when Paul became the messenger to the Gentiles, there were those of the Jewish uh, heritage that were accusing Paul of really becoming a traitor. Said, Listen, you're forsaking your own people to go and preach to the Gentiles. And so Paul here is saying, Listen, I'm going to tell you the truth in Jesus' name. He says, I'm not going to lie to you. And listen, my conscience is in line with what the Holy Spirit is teaching me. So he's going to great pains to say to us that he to say to us, excuse me, that he is going to speak the truth. And that he truly believes that what he is going to speak is in fact in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And so in verse 2, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. And we see here as Paul begins to look at how the nation of Israel has responded to Jesus the Messiah. Do you remember what Jesus did when he looked over Jerusalem? Remember, he wept over them and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you as the hen gathers her chicks. But Jesus understood also that he would be rejected by most of the folks. So nationally, um, it, we could say that the nation of Israel has in fact rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. Now, are there people of Jewish heritage uh, who have received Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? Absolutely. Uh, but as a nation, they have rejected Christ and do not accept Him as their Messiah. And this caused Paul great sorrow. Look at verse 3. He said, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. And, and what Paul is saying here, and, and he knows that doctrinally it's not possible. He understands that, that it, it's not something that he could literally do, but he's saying, I have such a love and, and such a desire to see my people accept Christ that I would be willing to go and become cursed and, and die and go to hell on behalf of my people if that were possible. And so we see that great love that we read about in the book of John where it says greater love has no man than what? 
than he give his life for a friend. And of course we know of one other who had such a love, don't we? Praise God that Jesus Christ had that same love. And you see, the reason that Paul couldn't be a substitute for the nation of Israel or anyone else for that matter is because Jesus Christ has already accomplished that substitution. Jesus Christ has already provided for salvation and redemption and justification and all of the benefits that we as Christ followers can enjoy. And so Paul knew that. He understood that. And he wasn't uh, trying to say that he was asking God for permission to do that. He was just trying to demonstrate here what type of grief that he truly had for his people. He was sorrowful. I mean, this is a man who was so plugged in to the Jewish culture. Remember how he persecuted the church and how he was one of the leaders of, of the band of, of people who were trying to, to put the church down and to extinguish it. So Paul knows these people very well. He understands their culture and he loves them. Many of them probably are his dear friends and, and folks that he grew up with. And so he's simply expressing his grief and his sorrow as he sees them reject Jesus Christ. And so that begs the question, how do we respond when we see people rejecting Christ? Do we possess that same longing inside of us to see them get saved? I believe that's something that I could pray for. Lord, give me more of a compassion for lost people. And give me more of a desire to see people who once rejected you to come to faith. And I could pray for those folks. And I could try to conduct myself in such a way that I present truth and that I shine the light of Jesus Christ into the darkness of this world that we live in. And so that's the, the mindset and the attitude that, that Paul had towards his countrymen. He simply was saying, look man, it would be such a great desire of my heart to see them turn from the error of their way and simply accept Christ as Messiah. And by the way, I think it's still proper for us to pray that for anyone, Jew or Gentile. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see a revival break out across the world and to see many in many different countries come to Christ and how refreshing it would be for uh, Israel as a nation. In other words, most of the people uh, would receive Jesus as Messiah. Let's pray for the lost everywhere. I think that's a healthy thing for us to do. And so we, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, continue on as, as Paul kind of sort of continues his lament uh, over his, his people. Uh, you know, and, and now he starts to talk about, my goodness, if anybody was going to realize who Jesus was, certainly it should have been these people. Look at all the stuff that they had going for them. Look at all of the history that they had with God. And he begins to show us. Uh, so he says, if I were a, that I myself were accursed, up in verse 3, from Christ for my brethren. And then he says it this way. My countrymen according to the flesh. In other words, those people who were literally born nationally into the nation of Israel. Who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. And so we see here that, that as Paul uh, weeps literally over his people, that they've had great and glorious privileges in the past. And he begins to review those for us. He said, listen, they're Israelites. Members of God's ancient chosen people. 
That's what we're talking about here. He said that God had adopted that nation to be his son, according to Exodus 4 and 22. And he had delivered his people out of Egypt, Hosea 11.1 1 teaches us. He was a father to Israel in Deuteronomy 14 and 1. And Ephraim was his firstborn in Jeremiah 31, 9. And of course, Ephraim here is just another word used uh, to, to label the nation of Israel. We remember that the Shekinah, or the glory cloud, symbolized God's presence in their midst as the, the cloud of presence, if you will, um, followed them and guided them and protected them. It was with Israel and not the Gentiles that God made the covenants. It was with Israel, for example, that he made the Palestinian covenant, promising them the land from the river of Egypt to Euphrates, according to uh, Genesis 15, 18, which reads this way. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And I believe that the Bible teaches that it is with Israel that he will yet ratify his new covenant, promising the future conversion and blessing of a repentant Israel. Listen to Jeremiah 31 and 31 through 40. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I will remember it no more. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, be, er, depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The surveyor's line shall again extend straight forward over the hill Gareb, then it shall turn toward Goath. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate towards the east shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or thrown down anymore forever. It was to Israel that the law was also given. Moses gave it to them and to them alone. The elaborate rituals in the, in the tabernacle and the temple and the service of God that was connected with all of those things were given to Israel as well as to the priesthood. And in addition to all the covenants mentioned above, God made innumerable promises to Israel of protection, peace, and prosperity. And Paul is simply saying, my goodness, look at the heritage that these people have had with God. How in the world can they have had this type of relationship with God over all of these years and have had all of this history and yet reject Jesus as their Messiah. And what a tragedy it is when anyone rejects Christ 
And many of us could look back over the heritages of our families and we could see how the hand of the Lord has moved in our lives to protect us and to, to heal us from sicknesses and diseases and to walk with us through difficult times and yet there are still those who know Christ and know about him and they've even tasted of some of the goodness of God and yet they're stubborn and they're stick, stiff necked and more and more and more here in our culture in this United States of America people are rebelling against an almighty and a loving God and it is a tragedy to see people rejecting Christ And we should be prayer warriors. We should understand that we are in a spiritual war. We are in warfare big time. And the powers of Satan and his minions, he knows his time is short and he is doing everything he can do to wreak havoc and to steal and to kill and to destroy as many lives as he can possibly destroy. Yet the Spirit of God calls and woos and knocks at the door. And, and I ask you this question, church. Are we working in cooperation with what God's Holy Spirit is doing? Or have we become so indifferent that we have stopped to care? That we're just no longer interested in what other people do? Because, hey, we're fine. Our bills are paid and we're somewhat comfortable. And so, hey, we just don't care. You know, that's a sign of the end times in the book of Matthew. It says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And so as we have just simply begun to enter into this great chapter of God's word, we come to that time in our service where we need to bring it to a close. And so in the same way that Paul is lamenting over the nation of Israel and begging God for their salvation, truly, even stating to God, I would be willing to be cursed for them, who is it in your life that you be could begin to pray fervently for? Who is it that's in your family that as far as it is knowledgeable to you, not that we're passing judgment, but you know, they're just, they're just probably not saved. They've never made a known commitment to Jesus Christ. And if they were to die in their sin, you know the end of the story. Who is there that you know and love that you could begin to become fervent and put them in the bullseye of your prayers? <laughs> Folks, we need to pray for the lost. Here's what we know. The Holy Spirit is faithful. He is doing His work. He is knocking on hearts. He is accomplishing His purposes. He is using... Uh, anytime Scripture is read, anytime uh, Scripture is proclaimed, we know that God is being faithful. And so I ask you, what are we doing to cooperate and be faithful with Him? And I'm simply saying that I believe that there are people in our lives that we could begin to pray for. That we could begin to ask the Lord to intentionally use us as part of His process to reach out to those folks and to make them aware that there is a God who loves them. That there is a God who has gone to great measures to provide for their salvation. And there is a God who is standing at the door and knocking. And folks, I want to be part of spreading the gospel. I want to be that vessel that God uses to simply proclaim His truth. And I pray that you'll join me in that effort. In everything that we do, let us not become complacent. Let us not become so comfortable that we stop caring about people. But let us once again become fervent for the lost. Fervent for the empty seats that are represented by people who 
call this their church home, but they are not committed to be here. And I'm not judging, but I'm asking for God to place within them a desire. For God to place within them a, a willingness to become committed. For God to place in them a calling on their heart so that they become aware of their sin so that they might say yes to a Savior. Janet's going to come and help me as we uh, close our service. And, and here it is. Where is your hope this morning? I'm going to tell you my hope is squarely on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Remember folks, it is not about what we do. It's about what he has done. It's about what he has already provided and accomplished for us. And so let's get revigorated or reinvigorated. Let's get re charged up and let's understand that there is still much work to be done until Jesus returns. And let's agree to be part of that process. In whatever way, you can still be used by God. You have many gifts, many talents, and many abilities. There are many of you who are so talented and, and have so much potential. Just ask God, how can I help, Lord? What can I do to be part of this process? Let's stand and sing. reminded in a very powerful way that it is those of us who choose to build our lives upon the rock that when the storms come and when the testings happen that we will be able to stand firm not because of anything that we've built but the fact that we've chosen to build it upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that our feet are firmly planted on that rock. Lord, if there would be one here today whose foot is on the sand, my, my, Lord, I pray that you will reach inside of his or her heart and make them aware of their need to get their foot firmly planted on the rock of Jesus Christ. Lord, might they find your saving grace. And Lord, for the rest of us, I pray that you will just simply help us as we go our ways today, Lord, help us to stay focused on the things that matter to you. Lord, might we say enough of my way. No longer will it be my agenda, but God, it will be your agenda that will control my life. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen and amen. Don't forget the church picnic on August 9th.